my name is Dr. Lucy Thompson. I go by she, her, and I will be moderating this session this afternoon um, with the help of our fabulous tech support. First, we would like to thank the presenters for joining us this afternoon to share their work. And thank you all for being here today and joining us in the fantastic sessions that we've had so far. Um, I'm hoping that we can continue some of the great conversations that we had uh, this morning with some of our speakers this afternoon as well. Um, I've been asked to notify all attendees that the session is being recorded and to remind everyone um, to please stay muted with videos off unless you are presenting or asking a question. Um, so we have four presentations in this panel. First, Yuan Fang Dai will present her paper, Finding Chinese Feminisms in Transnational Feminisms. Second, Caitlin Barker will present her paper, International Anti-Colonial Womanhood, Matt Mounier's Political Thought and Chinese Knowledge Production on Cameroon, 1956 to 1965. Third, Dr. Odrin Omiegbe will present his paper, The Role of Women in Conflict Resolution and the Post-Conflict Environment in the Global South. And then fourth, Dr. Jakana Thomas will present her paper, Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, How Female Combatants Gender Peace Agreements in Civil Wars. Each paper will be 15 minutes long. Um, there'll be five minutes for questions after each individual paper, which should leave us a little time at the end for discussion and final comments or remarks from the panelists or attendees. And when the time comes, please ask questions by raising your hand or by typing this into the chat so that we can field the questions in order. So, without further delay, I am delighted to introduce our first presenter, Yuan Fang Dai, um, to present. Dr. Yuan Fang Dai is an assistant professor of writing and philosophy at Michigan State University and a faculty fellow and affiliate faculty um, for, the, uh, for MSU's Center for Gender and Global Context. Um, her research areas include feminist philosophy, social and political philosophy, ethics, and critical cultural studies. She has a special interest in gendered identity, cultural dynamics, transcultural experiences, and feminist solidarity across cultural differences. She is the author of Transcultural Feminist Philosophy, Rethinking Difference and Solidarity Through Chinese American Encounters, which was published in 2020. And she is currently writing a monograph tentatively titled Chinese Feminist Philosophy, Theorizing Chinese Feminism in Transcultural Contexts. She will now present her paper, Finding Chinese Feminisms in Transnational Feminisms. Please join me in welcoming Yuan Fang Dai. Hello. Now I, I cannot see the, I cannot share the screen. Um, you should be able to, as a co-host, hang on, let me make sure. Oh, no, no, okay, good. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, thanks to everybody who's uh, here. Um, so th today I'm going to talk about um, Chinese feminism in the context of trans uh, transnational feminism. There are two politically uh, loaded themes that I'm going to cover um, very briefly today. One theme is the knowledge production and asymmetrical distribution when Chinese feminists encounter transnational feminism. So I understand uh, international feminism, transnational feminism, and global feminism, uh, they, are, they have a history and uh, they refer to different things, but in, in today's presentation, just use international feminism, transnational feminism exchangeably uh, with acknowledgement of the differences among these concepts. The second theme is discursive um, power relations in the knowledge production of Chinese uh, feminist, feminist scholarship. I am going to talk about uh, women's studies in China. So before 2000, uh, women's studies in China emphasized practical women and uh, development pro um, projects. 
So this is mainly uh, NGO-based work. And in the 2000s, a shift from applied research, which is um, more like empirical research or NGO uh, kind of like work, uh, to focusing more on curriculum development and scholarship. So it's more, more about um, this women's studies as a discipline. There are shifts and changes in the 90s and the 2000s. The discourse on equality in China shifted from men, women, equality to gender equality in the 90s. We used to use like men and women, but gender was a, a new concept in, to Chinese uh, feminist scholarship in the 90s. So this was also when Chinese uh, studies um, scholar separated women from class, uh, which opened up space for demand for new theories because uh, women were considered as part of the, the proletarian uh, class. So uh, as the class was liberated, women was part of it. Next, I'm gonna call, uh, focus on gender in China because this is one, if not the concept uh, in feminist scholarship in China, but it's one of the most important uh, concept. The concept of gender is considered as Western idea that was introduced to China in the early 90, 1990s in the preparation for the United Nations Fourth World Conf Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995. So this is a really turning point for Chinese feminist scholarship, 1995. Gender is a epistemological shift for scholars in women's studies in China, providing new methods and topics for research because as earlier we mentioned, so it's shifted from men, women um, equality to gender equality. The dissemination of gender in China was based on, uh, was uh, based on a transnational network of individual scholars, institutions, NGOs, and financial backings from international donor agencies. Gender became a conceptual basis of the, institutionalization of women's studies as, academ as a academic discipline. So this gender really play plays an important role in the discipline. It, it also to a large extent defines the focus and strategies for Chinese feminist NGO fem uh, practical work. So both academically, theor theoretically and practically the concept of gender plays a, um, a very important role. However, people have re reservations about this um, concept. A small group of Chinese feminist scholars are dubious about the introduction of a feminist Western feminist concept into China. They were considering uh, there's, on the one hand, there's a necessity of adopting developed feminist theories and the gender is part of that. On the other, but on the other hand, the nationalist discourse and to resist to westernization. So they kind of caught in between these two things. At the same time, indigenization, so in this context, it mainly means a localization in Chinese called Bento Huai, really can make it local, becomes a representing voice in women's studies. And because this uh, small group of scholars wanted to um, localize Western concept to uh, local uses. So this, um, what they do uh, is actually a, a active epistemic disobedience. Take a broader perspective. It is resentment of a Western pressure to adapt to seemingly universal systems knowledge and the articulation of the particularity of the postmodern, post uh, socialist situation. So it's, it's really taught, uh, think they really thought about uh, under the pressure and that they wanted to have some sort of a, a unique uh, version of Chinese uh, feminism. And it indicates acts of epistemic dis disobedience against knowledge making entrenched with empirical or 
colonial purposes such as the U.S. and neoliberalism, and then uh, neoliberalism already kind of is uh, something that's for debate. But to people, some scholars thought that that's the reason for some of the the introduction of a gender to China. So there are consequences of the introduction um, to China uh, of gender to China. One consequence one consequence is the gender became the representative of a universal and a normalized um, feminism. And by accepting gender, Chinese feminism is assimilated to that standardized feminism. In, the, in other words, the particularity of Chinese feminism became local application of a U US-oriented universal um, feminism. So that is, um, this U.S. version of feminism became universal and Chinese feminism became a uh, local um, practice or application of that universal feminism. Another consequence is that the, the embrace of the concept of gender implies a break with the social um, tradition of women's liberation and thus discredits the uh, accomplishments of a socialist feminism because before the inter uh, introduction of a gender, um, so uh, there was like a, a, a feminist discourse based off this tradition of a, a women's uh, liberation, uh, the socialist feminism, but after the introduction of gender, so the discourse was changed. Now, there, these two consequences are directly related to the speculations or the difficulties or the troubling side of the dissemination of gender uh, in China. The difficulty what, uh, lies in maybe uh, a few um, aspects. One of the difficulties is that the dissemination of gender along with its major financial backing is suspected uh, to carry colonial or new colonial complications. Um, and also Western funding agencies, in particular, the Ford Foundation played a fundamental role in pushing Chinese uh, women's studies into particular ways of connecting with the international tracks in the 1990s. And uh, also the Ford Foundation founded the majority of women's studies from conferences and seminars, as well as NGOs, Women Development Project both academically and practically. Um, pretty much Ford, the Ford Foundation founded the majority of these uh, activities. Uh, so uh, about 90% of them. Let's talk about this international community, which is a very interesting topic. Chinese um, feminist scholars know that many projects and ideas and much of the funding come from abroad in the name of the international community. So I had a quote there because um, international in the sense, uh, a very interesting um, international. So I use this code, however, uh, use the code from uh, this scholar whose name is uh, Min Dong Chao. So she said, we are mostly in the dark or uh, reluctant to question what role the terms gender development and NGO play in the neoliberal development agenda and how this discourse uh, has ensured that gender has a place within international social movement. So people were not sure, like, so what this um, international community means. So next we move to this international feminism, um, say a few words about, uh, you know, and to me it's like more like a new ideological form uh, formation. International feminism is U.S. Um, oriented and to a large extent is based off U.S. liberal feminism. And I borrow this um, statement from Tara Penny Bar Bar Barlow. Barlow. So uh, she's mainly saying international feminism is U.S. Ford Foundation funded project for documenting crimes allegedly for, for, fomented by nation, nation states against the world's women. So that means uh, it means that you know the concept of gender or women or international feminism is financed by uh, international uh, founder uh, donors. Uh, especially U.S. Um, Ford Foundation, and to uh, to really kind of a challenge 
this crime is that each nation state uh, uh, allegedly uh, forced down their women. And there is also this concept of Asian women and the paradigm of de development, mainly in the form of an NGO work. The presumed connection between the category of gender and the paradigm of development, development in Asia. Um, female bodies in political economy, the Asian female labor bodies working in the specific places that uh, are called transnational sites of exchange and exploitation. So think about you know, some of the clothes we wear, like from uh, like a gab, for example, like probably from some of the factories that uh, um, uh, a lot of Asian women work in. The Asianness of workers becomes proper to the labor uh, demands for transnational capital capitalist growth um, in, in and international political harmony as a consequence of a carefully crafted and exploitable labor market. Really, Asian women play play a uh, important role in this um, labor market. And I'm gonna draw my conclusion here. Um, so connecting tracks, this is a, a very, uh, like, a, uh, like a Chinese uh, uh, concept. So gender is the most pronounced element, um, the place where more entrenched institutions are getting back on the track of the international current since the post-1970 reform movement. Because uh, at, uh, uh, in the middle of this reform, China really wanted to kind of connect with the international society. And uh, so the, uh, the, uh, we call it a uh, get, uh, like a connecting tracks because there's a China, Chinese track and there's international track. And the globally, derived concept of gender provides a means of criticizing the localized uh, effect of globalization in the absence of other possible discourses. I quote unquote globally because it mainly means uh, US. And also this globalization uh, in the, during the process of uh, globalization, so there are no, no other discourses available except for gender. I question the concept of gen, uh, the West. I think thinking in large blocks like the West is problematic. We should think as if the division between the so-called West and China is a artificial binary. So I'm Chinese um, by, um, by a region. So I, I don't really know my, where my Chinese starts and what, where my uh, US -ness uh, stars. We should refuse to treat Chinese feminism as a, der a derivative of feminist feminism everywhere, elsewhere, and, or a case study of a general feminist theory. We should be aware of power dynamics in transnational feminist scholar. So back to the themes we um, touched upon at the beginning of the presentation is really about the power dynamics in uh, knowledge product, um, production and how to have a Chinese feminist philosophy uh, and knowledge and also uh, theories and how, uh, how to um, look at the, its relationship with the transnational feminism. And lastly, um, so I want to look at the uh, relationship between the local and the global. From a theoretical standpoint, it is useful to comprehend contemporary Chinese feminist thought from the understanding that the local and the global are inextricably interacted, uh, interconnected. So this interconnectedness is really where I la uh, land my um, uh, conclusion. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron Fang, for that presentation. It seems to go by so quickly, but contains so much rich information about your thinking specifically on transculturalism, transnationalism, internationalism. I wonder if you could um, 
just st stop your screen share right now so that we can go to some questions. We have about five minutes between each, um, each speaker. So um, I'd like to open up the floor if anybody wants to raise their hand, unmute, uh, um, kind of uh, offer a question in the chat. Um, I wanna put it out to the audience here. Caitlin, do you want to unmute? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for your presentation, Professor Dai. I really found it very interesting. Um, I was hoping you could expand a little bit more on um, your point about how there's this discursive break between using man, woman, I'm assuming that's man, you, right, and, mm -hmm. uh, and gender. Um, was that just limited to like the NGOs and, and gender studies? To what extent has gender been taken up as a term that has political currency with say like the CCP? Do they use that term as well? Yes, yeah, CCP. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a very good question. So um, gender is so dominantly um, um, present in Chinese uh, academia and also NGO work, both uh, academic and uh, practical. So I remember when I was little, like, so we, we didn't use the term like gender much. Gender mainly on um, like forms, like, so you have your name, then you have a gender, like some male, female. But the, so Chinese uh, scholars really had a hard time distinguish sex and, and gender. So to them, like gender is more like a social sex. So it, there's a social dimension. So in the early uh, 90s, when the concept of gender was introduced or traveled to China, um, it was something new or evolutionary even for people to can really open their eyes. Oh, there's this category of analysis, uh, which is gender for us to use to analyze women uh, slash man uh, relationship, uh, relationship before, because before it's really men and women. So talk about biological. Uh, differences and that's like in the um, maybe in the in the 70s and that there are girls like women uh, holding up half half of the sky as tough as as guys so women can do anything but then then gradually realize no we are women so we have our um, own like a differences um, from men therefore the intro the tra the introduction of gender, the concept of gender to China really kind of uh, lend them new language to really talk about uh, women as women. So and then the, 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 the official disc, uh, uh, discourse, also the concept of gender was packaged into a lot of the official documents like United Nations documents and um, also through the preparation for the fourth UN uh, Conference on Women in China in 1995. So uh, you know, a lot of official documents and uh, meetings and uh, gender training, gender mainstreaming. So it really means make gen the concept gender as the mainstream concept, uh, like a concept of analysis. Therefore, it kind of uh, uh, gradually, but also abruptly kind of landed in China, um, both academic and then practically in NGO work. Of course, they got funding from uh, mostly from Ford, the Ford Foundation, and they use the rhetoric of gender to, to guide their work. Thank you. Uh, I have another question in the chat from um, Jamie Monson, um, who asks, how do you see the possibility of South-South connections and how these are positioning China West or local global frameworks, or perhaps repositioning those frameworks? Thank you for the, this great question. I like the idea with South South. <laughs> um, so, and so, uh, one of the things I've been trying to do, um, like in my academic work, is to um, cultivate a transcultural um, approach. And so, which I did in my um, in the book that came out, and also in this um, one that I'm working on is transcultural perspective, so that, like like these cultures, U.S. culture and the Chinese culture, for example, or like, like a, a cultures in the South. And uh, I remember when I was little, we talk about like uh, Asian, Asian, Asian and Latin Americans and Africans, uh, like uh, brother and sister, do should go hand in hand, things like that. Really South and South uh, collaboration, uh, 
um, uh, uh, really any solidarity and uh, in transnational and transcultural solidarity is one of the themes that really I really focus on. But um, unfortunately, I think predominant, predominantly um, multiculturalism is really a, one of the main discourse in the United States, we look at each culture as if they have clear boundaries. Um, and so there's West, when we talk about West, we really like, we know what we are referring to, but not exactly. But I really like the South-South idea. Thank you. Thanks, Yuan Fang. And um, I'm hoping we can come back together at the end, but um, I'm gonna now move up onto our next speaker. So, um, our second presenter, um, following Caitlin's wonderful question, um, is actually Caitlin Barker. Um, Caitlin Barker is a third year PhD student in the history department at Michigan State University, where she studies modern African intellectual history with a particular interest in China-Africa relations during the Cold War. Her dissertation will investigate how a diverse array of Cameroonians um, mediated Chinese knowledge production on Africa and imperialism during delegation visits to the PRC and as they hosted Chinese delegates in Cameroon. Prior to beginning her PhD, Caitlin served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon and spent three years teaching in the PRC. She will now present her paper, International Anti-Colonial Womanhood, Mart Mumier's Political Thought and Chinese Knowledge Production on Cameroon, 1956 to 1965. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin Barker. Wonderful, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, great. So hi everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and for being here today. The research I'm going to present began as a section of my MA thesis. I plan to expand on it in my dissertation, which will explore how Cameroonian delegates to the PRC helped mediate Chinese knowledge production on Africa from the 1950s to the 1970s. This research is still very much in progress and I look forward to your questions and feedback. In an interview for Swiss television in November 1960, five days after her husband was assassinated in Geneva by the French Secret Service, Marthe Mumier spoke frankly of the dangers she faced as a Cameroonian anti-colonial activist. When the male interviewer began by asking her whether she had been aware of her husband's political activities, she responded, quote, of course, not only was Monsieur Mumier my husband, but he was also my comrade in arms because I myself am a militant of this party. Given that her husband had just been assassinated for his anti-imperialist activism, this bold declaration of affiliation with the UPC, Cameroon's main anti-colonial party, constituted a significant act of bravery and defiance. Shortly after she gave this interview, Mumie sent her only surviving daughter to the People's Republic of China for safety and to study, exemplifying the close affinity both she and her husband felt towards the PRC. In her activism, interviews, and writings, Mumie navigated between multiple roles loyal wife and devoted mother, professional nurse and anti-colonial militant, demonstrating the multifaceted nature of Cameroonian anti-colonial womanhood. She inhabited, she inhabited these roles simultaneously, but strategically emphasized one or the other depending on the context and her particular goals. This paper will analyze Mumie's multifaceted anti-colonial womanhood by close reading her writings from 1961 and to 2006 on anti-imperialism and her relationship with the PRC state. Closely examining how one Cameroonian woman writes about her own experience of the global Cold War and tracing one facet of her many international linkages allows for new perspectives on African women's engagement with global anti-imperialism. Born in 1931 in the South region of Cameroon, Mumie's life intersected with a wide array of global forces and international actors. She attended a school run by American Protestant missionaries and later became a nurse in the French colonial health system, where she worked alongside her husband, Félix Mumie, the Dakar-trained doctor and eventual leader of the UPC. Mumie herself was editor-in-chief of Femme Camerounaise, the newspaper of the UPC women's affiliate uh, Union Démocratique des Femmes Camerounaises, which I will call UDEFEC, 
which was supported by the Women's International Democratic Federation, or WIDF. Until the French expelled the UPC from French Cameroon in 1955, Mumie worked as both nurse and anti-colonial activist wherever her husband was posted in the colony. After 1955, she and fellow UPC and UDEFEC leaders lived in exile in a variety of African countries while continuing to carry out their political activities from afar. British Southern Cameroons, Khartoum, Cairo, Conakry, and Algiers all served as temporary homes for Mumie. Mumie left behind two major writings, one written in 1961 when she was 30 and the other in 2006 when she was 75. Although both are framed as biographies of her famous husband, they are in many ways more revealing of her than they are of him, and I argue that both can be read as autobiographies. She wrote each one in direct response to global imperialism. The slim 1961 pamphlet without a title was published shortly after her husband's assassination while she wrote the 2006 book to counter French legislation requiring teachers to emphasize the, quote, positive aspects of French colonialism. Because Mumie was trained as a nurse and worked for several years within the French colonial health system alongside her husband, a doctor, she is able to speak with particular eloquence and authority about the relationship between health, the body, and French imperialism. In recounting her husband's medical training in Dakar, she notes that the university he attended did not grant medical degrees of the same equivalence with those in the metropole. Rather, Felix was granted the title African doctor so as to, quote, clearly show that it was a purely African position that could only be exercised within Africa, always under the supervision of a doctor from the metropole. In Mumie's view, this two-tiered medical education system was to have fatal consequences for her husband. According to her 1961 account, when Felix Mumier fell ill in Geneva, he self-diagnosed his symptoms as those of thallium poisoning, but the Swiss doctors did not believe him for several days. Thus, in her analysis, quote, the incorrect diagnosis and the incorrect treatment contributed to the rapid progression of his illness. Granted, it is far from certain that an earlier diagnosis would have saved Felix Mumier, and it is also unclear how how Marc Mumier knew about this interaction since she had no communication with her husband between the time that he was poisoned and when he slipped into a coma. Still, the fact that she presents it this way is significant as it is part of her broader project to show the harmful effects of imperialism on the health and safety of her family. And in 1955 petition to the United Nations on behalf of the editorial board of Femme Camerounaise, her newspaper, Mumie decries the lack of proper birthing centers for Cameroonian women. Quote, African women, especially Cameroonians, give birth on the bare ground in the lying in centers, and that gives rise to a, rise to a high rate of infant mortality, she wrote on behalf of the Udefec paper. By using its own health system to criticize the French colonial regime, Mumie was both speaking from a position of authority as a nurse and tapping into well-established concerns on the part of many Cameroonian women in the colonial period. For her audience in 2006, her discussion of medicine showed that the medical system could not be considered one of the elusive positive aspects of French colonialism. Nowhere is Mumie more scathing of French imperialism than in her description of how the French brought about the deaths of her daughter Annie and her husband Felix. Although her daughter Annie died of malaria, Mumie argues that the French deliberately posted her family in an undesirable rural area in northern Cameroon that was rife with malaria as a punishment for her husband's activism and thus should bear the blame for Annie's death. As a young and grieving mother separated from her one living child and recently made a widow by the French, Mumie used this story to impress upon her readers just how much the colonial regime had taken from her family. Indeed, in her writings on French imperialism, Mumie often adopts the role of wife and mother precisely because she was attuned to the politics of this approach. Yes, she was an educated employee of the colonial medical system and a UPC militant, but at times she downplayed those identities, foregrounding instead her identity as wife and mother in order, sorry, um, in order to highlight the failings and intimate violence of France's civilizing mission. For example, 
She devoted long sections in both writings to presenting the political thought of her husband, but she never speaks explicitly of her own theories, remaining instead in the role of supportive wife. In discussing China, Mumie shifts into her role as anti-colonial activist in her own right, speaking of her own experiences and accomplishments instead of those of her husband. Writing in 2006, Mumie recounts her 1957 visit to the PRC in terms that stress her own agency. She states that Chinese women from the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization invited the Cameroonian UDEFEC leaders to the PRC in order to have what she called, quote, an exchange about their experiences in the anti-colonial struggles. She describes how the Cameroonian women informed the Chinese women about the fight that we were leading for independence and about the repression we suffered. The way she frames this is important. The Cameroonian women were not visiting so they could learn from the PRC. Instead, they came to exchange experiences with Chinese women, seemingly as equals, and to inform them of the situation in Cameroon. This description of her visit is the only direct reference we have in Mumie's writings to her own interactions with Chinese people, and the picture she paints is one of equality and professional cooperation. Strikingly, it is also a gendered account. She is interacting with the PRC in a female space with female hosts, fellow female international militants. Her account calls into question many of the existing studies of foreign delegations in the PRC, which, to take an example from Julia Lavelle, tend to portray African guests as gratefully dependent on their Chinese hosts. Reading Mumie's description of serious professional collaboration with Chinese women also complicates the picture of the PRC as isolated and paranoid during the time of the Sino-Soviet split, as depicted, for example, in Anne-Marie Brady's scholarship, among other works. The Chinese women who hosted Mumie were engaged in important diplomatic work of the sort Wang Zheng points to in her project to find women in the state. Thus does adding gender into the analysis complicate accounts of Chinese foreign policy that focus on high-ranking men from which emerges a picture of diplomatic isolation. If women are the focus, however, Chinese foreign policy in 1957 looks quite different. In April 1961, Chairman Mao spoke to a visiting group of African and Asian delegates saying, we don't have a clear understanding of African history, geography, or the present situation, so a concise book is badly needed, and adding that we can invite African friends to help. African delegations to the PRC, such as the one Mumie participated in, were an important source of knowledge for the PRC state during this period and producing knowledge about anti-colonial counterparts in the decolonizing world without the West as an intermediary was a crucial outcome of the visits. Details from the conversations Mumie had during her 1957 visit to the PRC soon appeared in Chinese writings on African decolonization, and Mumie thus helped unmask the true nature of French colonization before a wide audience in the PRC. She was not the only Cameroonian who made this journey. More than two dozen delegations of Cameroonian anti-colonial activists, women, youth, trade unionists, novelists, and government officials traveled to the PRC between the mid-1950s and the late 1970s. During the same period, Chinese state-produced writings on Cameroon evolved dramatically. Chinese documents reveal that PRC officials took exhaustive notes of dialogues with African delegates, incorporating them into material for both the state and the public. Here, it is clear from the cover art alone <coughs> that Chinese views of Africans were changing rapidly in this period. And the information on Cameroon became, becomes increasingly detailed from one publication to the next. For example, although UDEFEC was generally referred to as the women's wing of the UPC in most UPC party materials and in Western scholarship, the fact that the 1959 Chinese publication makes separate reference to them as Cameroon's Women's Federation indicates a familiarity with the organization that likely came about as a result of the UDEFEC delegation's visit, and similar details appear in the 1960 publication as well. Reading Mumie's account of her visit to China alongside Chinese publications on Africa indicates that Mumie and her role as anti-colonial activist played an important role in mediating Chinese understandings of Africa. To conclude, 
To demonstrate the pernicious effects of French colonialism on the family and intimate spaces, Mumier writes as a grieving wife and mother who lost both husband and youngest daughter to forces she traces back to the French. However, in her discussions of China, she speaks instead as a worldly international anti-colonial activist, as it was in this capacity that she visited China in 1957. And in her indictment of the French colonial medical system, she writes from a position of authority as a trained nurse within that same system in order to unmask the French civilizing mission. Throughout, she is engaged in a deliberate project to challenge dominant historical narratives by writing herself, her family, and her party into the global history of decolonization in a way that emphasizes their ideological independence and agency within the confines of the global Cold War. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I think there's just so much um, in your talk that really elaborates on um, the, the previous question actually about South-South connections and solidarity and those who choose to um, work and fight together, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, again, I just want to open it straight up to the floor for any questions. So please just raise your hand or type questions into the chat. Um, I'm not, oh, okay. Jakana, um, is there any sense that these connections happened more frequently or was this a one-off? Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, definitely these happened more frequently. Um, I know just for the Cameroon case, for example, there were at least 200 delegates who visited China um, in about a 20 year period. Um, and many of them have written about it. Um, and my dissertation research will delve further into their experiences as well. So it won't just be focused on this one person. Um, but my advisor, Jamie Monson, who asked the question about South-South connections, um, her work right now is looking at similar delegates from East Africa. So um, there, this was a huge project that the Chinese state undertook. And it wasn't just China. There were all kinds of people-to-people -people delegations occurring, especially in the socialist world, between like the, the 20s and the 70s, I would say. The Soviet Union um, is one of the examples that's been most studied in the scholarship, I would say. So um, the China-Africa uh, connections were um, definitely more than just this one um, example. Thank you. Yuan Fang, did you have a question too? I saw that you physically had your hand raised. <laughs> yeah, I did. I tried to raise my virtual hand, but I couldn't find it. Um, <laughs> um, so that's a great talk. I really like the um, the content. I wonder, like, so that's a, 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 you you covered the period in nineteen um, fifty six to sixty five. That's be before Cultural Revolution. Um, so I wonder, like, what's the like a state of a, a contemporary uh, women in 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 the like a region that you were talking about? You know, still there's much of an interaction with China, or is pretty much that existed uh, in the fifties and sixties? You mean is what is the state of contemporary interactions today between them? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, an excellent question. I mean, I I don't study that in my research. My research ends um, right at the end of the Cultural Revolution, actually, because there was still some interaction, especially Chinese um, delegations began visiting Cameroon in 1971, once the mm -hmm. two countries finally established diplomatic relations. But I know anecdotally, <laughs> I lived in the PRC for three years, and I knew a lot of okay. Cameroonian students um, who, mm -hmm who are doing degrees in the PRC. So um, there's quite a lot of research actually on contemporary Cameroon PRC relations, um, in particular relating to economic relations um, and sort of environmental issues. Cameroon has a large uh, like timber industry that exports mm. to the PRC a lot. So a lot of people have studied forestry and things like that. Um, but I expect to learn more about this as I someday hopefully can uh, embark on my field work. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Caitlin. <laughs> okay, so I will, I'll go ahead and, 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 and um, introduce you um, and then we can move forward with your paper. Um, so we're really pleased to have um, Dr. Jakana Thomas with us today. Um, Dr. Thomas is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Michigan State University. Her research focuses on political violence with an emphasis on the behavior of violent non-state actors. Her recent work examines women's participation in rebel, terrorist, and community-based violent organizations, how violence influences conflict resolution, the correlates of terrorist lethality, and the determinants of successful peace processes. She will now present her paper, Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, How Female Combatants Gender Peace Agreements in Civil Wars. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jakana Thomas. Okay, well, thank you. Um, can you see my screen just fine? So I'd like to just tell you that I might go through this quite quickly because this is not meant to be a 15 minute presentation, but I'm going to make it that way. Um, so please bear with me. Okay, so today I'm gonna give a talk about how female rebels can gender peace processes. Um, and the specific research question I'm gonna focus on here is how do female rebels influence peace processes, um, specifically in terms of the types of peace agreements they shape and the types of women-specific peace terms that are incorporated into these peace agreements. And one of the big innovations of this project is gonna be to focus on which ones, which specific peace terms we see uh, female rebels pushing for. Um, so existing literature finds that in 40% of the conflicts that have terminated in peace agreements um, between 1975 and 2001, we see these gendered agreements produced, right? Um, and existing, and when I uh, refer to gendered peace terms or gendered provisions, um, what I'm referring to are uh, terms such as all women and men should be equal, um, which was represented in Burundi, the Rusha agreement, um, or that uh, political partners or political parties need to ensure that social and political organizations adopt specific policies to promote the role of women, um, which was in Guatemala's accord for lasting peace. Um, and the Paul Comprehensive Peace Agreement included a term that suggested that both sides should fully agree to the protection of the rights of women and children and to immediately stop gender-based violence, specifically sexual violence against women and children. So these are the types of gender peace terms I'm talking about here. Um, and a specifically or particularly exemplary case here is Colombia's peace agreement um, from 2016 that was signed with the FARC. And although we tend to think about peace agreements, we think about these highly militaristic documents that talk about cordoning off troops and um, demobilization and um, uh, giving in weapons, this agreement had over 200 mentions of the word mujer or woman, um, more than 50 mentions of the word gender, which is very strange, or I mean, very different. Um, and in this context, there were 20% uh, of the negotiators were women, 40% of the peace delegates were women, and particularly important, which I'm gonna focus on a lot in this talk, is 40% of, up to 40% of the rebel group, the FARC, was composed of women, and some of these women were peace negotiators and delegates as well. Um, and previous explanations for how Colombia's agreement has become gendered and why 40% of the agreements that uh, uh, are gendered have become uh, so women-focused has focused on three main classes of actors. The first one is about women's formal participation in the negotiation process. Um, the second one is that they expect that these gendered peace agreements are gonna be produced where women from, uh, civilian women from civil society and these peace, uh, um, peace organizations participate, these are gonna be uh, more likely to be gendered. And then finally, scholars have focused on international governmental organizations like the United Nations, specifically Uni uh, UNIFEM or UN Women, um, and their role in gendering these peace processes or motivating um, women, the incorporation of women's interests in these processes. Um, and uh, most notably, these ideas fit in with this broader women, peace, and security agenda that was uh, spurred by the Security Council Resolution 1325 in 2000, um, which says a lot of things, but one of the, I guess, most important for this pro uh, uh, project is that um, the Security Council reaffirmed the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts and in peace building. Um, but this, this 
specific resolution focused a lot on um, how incorporating civilians and peace female peacekeepers would help to build and maintain peace. Um, so this is kind of the picture that the 1325 and the resulting Women, Peace and Security agenda has given us that when we see civilian women side by side with peacekeepers, this is how we get this really stable peace, yet it's left out uh, completely the role that female combatants or women within these conflicts might play in helping to, in some case, further peace, but specifically gender peace. Um, and this is particularly important in light of the statistics that show um, women actually often lack formal, formal access to peace processes. And so although they seem to, su seem to suggest that civil society and female negotiators from civil society are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, um, statistics thus far show us that on only 9% of uh, nego uh, negotiators have been women between 1992 and 2011. 4% of signatories have been women, and only 2.5% of mediators have actually been women. So clearly, although there are some exceptions, we see that women's formal participation is really rare in this process. And so it doesn't help us understand a lot about how we get this, uh, these large, uh, this large number of um, gendered agreements when formal participation is one of the primary avenues by which they expect these processes to be gendered. However, what we do know is that there are there's a large representation of female rebels around the world in these uh, conflicts. Um, so some of my work from Africa showed that in violent political organizations, 45% um, of these groups have women as members. Um, when we just look at female combatants, so women in combat roles in these organizations globally, 40% of rebel groups have women in these roles. And again, um, other scholars have showed that 28% of contemporary rebel organizations have women in leadership roles. So women are more often represented as rebels than they are as formal mediators. So one question is, what difference does this participation make for maybe the policies that are adopted, but then also the policies that are implemented? So the presentation today is really only going to focus on this first question about the policies that are implemented in these peace agreements. Um, and I argue in this paper, which is part of a broader book project, that women should be able to impact this peace process um, because they both have the willingness to do so and the opportunity. Um, so women have incentives, so a willingness to kind of push through this gendered peace process um, because women like men are political animals, right? They, they, they care about politics as much as men do. Um, and one of the leading explanations for why women join groups are about political and ideological affinities. So groups that have egalitarian ideologies or specifically gendered ideologies that are pro-women, they're more likely to see women's participation in these um, violent political groups. Um, and an example from the Communist Party in Nepal shows that um, women in the CPN uh, joined the organization largely because of the class struggle, but a good proportion of them actually joined to rebel against gender discrimination. An even larger proportion said that even though that wasn't the primary reason they joined, that's the thing they liked most. And 15% of women suggested that that was one of the most important things uh, that the CPN had to do to maintain their participation. So uh, in other words, gender equality actually matters for the women who join these militant organizations. Another reason to believe that women have these incentives is that war transforms women's role in society. They're often able to have experiences through participating in rebellion that they've never been able to have. Um, however, these transformations are not always present a permanent and we sometimes see regressions back to the status quo so pre-conflict uh, positions and status uh, women often go back to those things even in context where women participated quite a lot in rebel organizations but there were no peace agreements um, these peace processes however um, offer this opportunity to submit some of these important changes because scholars have found that these peace agreements are legally binding documents that can prevent violent actors from backsliding on those promises that they've made to women into society more broadly. Um, so that can be the government, but it also could be rebel organizations. Um, so in addition to this incentive, we also should think that women have the opportunity by virtue of being one of the primary parties to conflict. Um, and so although scholars have noted that the primary way that we get these gender agreements is through civil society participation, or third party participation, practitioners uh, have showed that it's actually the primary parties, so governments and rebels, that are prioritized in getting to the table, often leading to the exclusion of some of these um, third parties. But if re women are rebels, they're already 
they already have a level of access that these third parties wouldn't have that mightn't allow them to have this level of influence. Additionally, Christine Bell argues that it's not about being in the negotiating room. It's really about having these firm communication channels between those negotiators and those in the uh, rebel organization and rebel leadership and rank and file. Um, and where there are subsets of the group that are particularly influential, um, this is where we expect their uh, views and their preferences to be um, considered. And so if someone were to ask, well, why would we consider the uh, preferences of a woman rebel? Well, uh, Kristen William, Williams asked us to um, think about what would happen if we ignored 30% of any armed force, and this is what we're talking about in the FARC and in the Communist Party in Nepal and in the EPLF and lots of other cases. Um, however, one, when we start to think about these gendered interests that we expect women to push forward in these uh, agreements, one must ask, what are women's interests? And we must realize that there are no homogeneous set of interests that all women would share, which means that all women would not necessarily advocate for the same thing. And so when we're trying to think about what women might, what rebel women might advocate for, um, it is important to think that women's interests are complex, cross-cutting, and they're developed by where they are from in society. And so they play this kind of identity politics game. And it's important to think about what those identities are. Um, additionally, it's essential to realize that often rebel women don't have the same interests as mainstream feminists and may not advance those same types of um, broad ideas of uh, women's interests. So, for example, whereas mainstream feminists might care about things like women's emancipation or uh, gender equality or women's empowerment, uh, marginalized women, which uh, communities from which rebel women are typically drawn, um, and violent women might have a different set of interests, and those are going to be identified by their, or I guess, uh, identified by their immediate perceived needs. So what marginalized women or marginalized rebel women or violent women think that they need at any given time? Um, so in this project, I lay out five hypotheses. I'm really only going to talk about two of the most important ones. Um, the first one is this idea that given that women, rebel women tend to be drawn from marginalized groups of society, they're going to be interested in not only representing gendered interests, but also the interests of marginalized groups of uh, women. And so again, the Communist Party in Nepal is a good example because women were painfully aware that they were often fighting what uh, they termed a two-line struggle of double oppression. So they were both women, but they were also of the oppressed class. And so they were fighting for women at the same time as fighting for marginalized people and marginalized women. Um, the second hypothesis takes on this idea that women are going to care about their immediate perceived needs again. Um, and therefore, they're going to advance the things that maybe rebel women in particular might need that might be different than what civil society women or women in government or women from IGOs might care about. Um, and so one way to think about this is to think about the direct things that female combatants might need that would be different than other groups of women in society. Um, so to kind of test these ideas, I use um, data from the Peace Agreements database, which was compiled by the University of Edinburgh, and this includes uh, all peace agreements from 1990 to 2008, and I call the data to only include peace agreements that correspond to civil wars because this is the type of conflict I'm interested in measuring. Um, I have two main uh, dependent variables to examine these two hypotheses. Um, the first one is a measure of whether the peace agreement has specific gendered language discussing um, uh, the inclusion of political uh, and socially excluded, historically socially excluded groups on two different dimensions, whether they just ask for um, horizontal inequality between groups of people in society, but also whether they specifically focus on particularly marginalized groups in society and incorporating marginalized women. To test this second hypothesis about female combatant immediate perceived needs, I examine, uh, again, two different types of variables. One is whether there's a demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration uh, program specifically for women, and then also whether there are rehabilitation programs specifically for women, whereas DDR is all about female combatants. Rehabilitation programs are broader, but they could also benefit female combatants as well. Um, so to test this, uh, to the main independent variable here, uh, which again is measuring um, females' participation in rebellion, um, I draw data from the Women in Armed Rebellion data set, um, which is a data set I compiled with Reed Wood at the University of Essex, and this measures female combatant participation in over 300 rebel organizations um, from 1964 to 2014. 
Um, the specific measure that I have here is uh, ordinal variable, which ranges from a zero to three, where zero is no women at all, three is greater than 20%. So that's a high proportion. Um, so the uh, result, um, I won't, I'll spare you the details of the, the long tables, but the results here show that this is largely, the, the results are largely consistent with the, ex, with the expectations here. Um, the first level, which says any gender provision, shows that female combatants are not associated with change, with um, incorporation of just any gendered provision, right? So if we look at all gendered provisions and aggregate them together, they don't really help push for just any type of gendered provision. They seem to care specifically about these women's uh, issues that are intimately related to their narrow parochial interests as marginalized women and violent women. Right. And so they uh, increase uh, women's uh, participation in a rebellion increases the probability that women would uh, increases the probability of the incorporation of a, a demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration process, uh, program that is specifically gendered, or a rehabilitation program that's gendered. And it also includes the probability that peace agreements are going to include. Um, uh, um, they're going to include provisions that specifically uh, try to include historically marginalized or excluded groups of women in society or that call for horizontal um, uh, equity or uh, equality here. Um, a couple of things that we would not necessarily expect female combatants to care about that maybe uh, civil society women might care about or women from uh, intergovernmental organizations might care about are things like international law or institutional politics or traditional politics. Again, we don't see these are the things that female combatants really push for um, in these uh, peace agreement provisions. So there are several conclusions of this um, project that I'm presenting today. The first one is that female combatants actually do seem to have some influence over um, the peace process, specifically in shaping what peace agreements look like. They seem to push specifically for the inclusion of provisions that address historical marginalization of groups of women. They seem to push for provisions that help women um, demobilize and I guess move from conflict to post-conflict society, but they don't push for all gendered uh, provisions, right? And this is a very important point because it also suggests um, that if I had the, if I were able to show the broader results which compared uh, rebel women to other women, women are not actually a homogeneous group, right? And this seems obvious, but the literature thus far and these broader policy initiatives treat women as if they are a homogeneous group, right? And there's this intersectionality that, that's happening, and there's this variation in these interests that are happening. Um, and most importantly, one can say that what these outcomes are, and, and here I'm looking at the peace agreements um, and, and specific provisions, but what outcomes are um, is going to depend on which women are included in a specific uh, process. And um, you can't simply just add women in mix and get the same result. And this is particularly important in light of this women peace and security agenda that has been advanced by the UN, but that has been picked up by um, all types of government. Our uh, State Department is currently implementing a women peace security agenda that recognizes that women have a positive role in both the execution of violence, but also in peace. However, if they continuously focus on civilian women or they continuously focus on civil society women, they miss a group of, of women that are that's actually, you know, affecting these policies that they care about, which suggests that we should we should focus more on what violent women are doing. This is not at all to glorify violent women, but they're already present, right? And so to recognize their contributions uh, to peace would be to also recognize the potential for, you know, establishing peace and uh, gaining some of these important gender changes that might influence downstream consequences for women's politics. Um, so thanks so much for listening to this presentation. I look forward to your feedback. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. Sorry, I was muted there um, <laughs> for that. Um, incredible walk through some amazing data, um, actually, and analysis. Um, I want to move quickly to questions because it looks like we have our fourth presenter back on the line and we'll be able to get that paper in as well. So um, can I open up the floor for questions?
I think if I were to ask a question, it would be um, really how much do you know about the experiences of women within these organizations when they come into the organization with this real desire for gender justice and kind of that that part of the fight? Because um, I know in lots of um, rebel or left wing organizations, a lot of the time those kinds of interests can be subsumed by um, a kind of dominant focus on class, for example, which really dismisses like feminist concerns. So I'm just wondering if you know. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, I think there are three answers to this. The first one is that all women don't actually come in with a strong gender consciousness. They come in because they're attracted to maybe the, the, the idea that they could help with the class struggle or these other lot, political lines of conflict. But then they um, become socialized into the conflict with other women and realize that they do have these gendered interests that are important. Um, and so it's partially in participating with other women that some women come into their gender consciousness. Um, the other thing to note, though, is that although some women and many women actually develop this gender consciousness or they might have it as when they enter into these organizations, um, it doesn't necessarily mean even the most egalitarian organizations are interested in pushing for women's interests, right? And so we saw this case with the CPN and the Maoists where um, women in the organization cared about the class struggle. They came to care about the gender struggle as well, but they noted many times that it was a constant struggle even with their comrades. Even as their comrades were talking about equality, what they, their default was to always focus on the class struggle and to say, hey, will subordinate those interests for now for the broader society's goal, right? And, and the CPN women were kind of relentless, and in some cases they got help from women on the outside, and so they were able to make changes in spite of their male comrades. And we also saw this in other cases, like in uh, the Southwest People's Organization, where women were like, hey, we have these really important interests, you have to take the women's question up. And SWAPO says, you know, let's deal with the, the dominant issues that affects everybody. And when we win, we'll deal with your issues as well. And so it's not uncommon to see groups try to subordinate women's interests and even leftist groups that we tend to think of as egalitarian. Um, and so there's, it's not as if it's not a monumental feat for women to be able to even push these interests through these peace agreements. It's actually quite hard. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I think when we see them, it's a testament to their will and, and their you know I guess tenacity absolutely thank you um, do we have any other questions from the audience I'm not seeing any raised hands but we can come back um, at the end if we have time um, I am Noticing here that we have been rejoined by our um, final presenter. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Odrin Omeyegbi on the, it looks like on the line. Um, I'm just going to ask you to unmute. And then hopefully we can move to that presentation and have a little, a couple of minutes for questions at the end. Hello, I think we have sound. I think we have sound now. Mm. We would like you to unmute. We can hear you, Dr. Omiyagbe. Yes, yes. Thank you very Welcome. much for, for having me. <laughs> Welcome. Are you, um, are you ready to present? If so, I'll introduce yes. you. Yes, yes. Okay, so please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Odrin Omiyagi, oh. who is going to present... So how does this paper. work? I have to use my other... This. The ro who's going to present his paper. The Role of Women in Conflict Resolution and the Post-Conflict Environment in the Global South. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Omiyegbe. Thank you. I'm happy to be on to speak to you. Good afternoon. For well, here in Nigeria, is good evening. Humans are social beings. Interact with one another. Oh. Yeah. 
I'm saying that humans are social beings, they interact with one another, which sometimes result in conflicts that involve communities or countries and span throughout a period of time due to personal interest. When such conflicts arise, they snowball into squabbles, fights, or wars, which result into maiming of people, destruction of lives and properties. Nevertheless, the United Nations, right from its inception in 1945, has been in the forefront in ensuring peaceful coexistence among nations and resolving of conflicts when they arise. Since the United Nations passed Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security in 2000, it has gradually been acknowledged that women should have a powerful and decisive role in conflict prevention and resolution. This is indeed laudable. However, what is the contribution of women especially women with disabilities, as agents of peace, United Nations system. How do they function as mediators and in transitional justice processes? How can they promote or create a more gender equal society post conflict? What challenges and opportunities do they face in doing so? What innovations exist that can help qualitatively and qualitatively improve their participation in peace process. How can United Nations exercise nations to improve gender equality? These questions require appropriate answer to ensure the resolution of It requires answer to ensure the realization and active participation of women in peace process. To help me to arrive at meaningful conclusion, I decided to carry out a research and also use literature review. And I have some findings. Research was done here in, in Nigeria in the Delta and uh, at the blue states. And these are the, the findings which I would like to share with you. The findings shows that women are active agents of peace in armed conflict, and that they have done tremendously in places like Uganda peace talks in 1994, Liberia 2003, Goma Peace Conference, and many other, other others. You can find them in my paper. And given this extent of significance of women's role in global uh, South, it is found out that they have low participation. And United Nations too have attested to this fact that women are ignored. If you look at their 2004 report, they specifically mention that although attempts have been made to include women in peace process, but they are relatively few. Having said that so far, the question I, I want to look at, which, which is uh, the focus of this paper, what of women with disabilities? Their case is worst off. Because in Nigeria, Persons with disabilities, they are stigmatized. They look them as inferior. And because of, of that, they don't allow them to participate in peace process. 
And in Nigeria, it is made up of a patriarchal system whereby male, the male dominates. Women are not allowed to talk. They, they don't participate in, in meetings. They, 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 they allow them to stay behind. Men take decisions. And for persons with disabilities, their case is worst off because people look at them as inferior because of their disabilities. They, they don't know that persons with, with disabilities, they have innate abilities. And when they are properly and, and, uh, harnessed, they will be able to contribute meaningfully to the development of, of their society. But for people living in Nigeria, they don't rec recognize them. Instead, they like keeping them in homes. That's why if you go to some Nigerian cities, you see persons with disabilities begging for, for arms in busy junction, religious places, because they believe that what they that they, they that they should be cared for, that they should live on charity. That is the reason why they don't allow them to participate in this process. And persons with with disabilities too, on on their own, they have like a mystical at, at, attitude towards participating in this process. They feel that because the society looks down on on them because they are being stigmatized. They, on their own, they, they now look inferior. So this paper is now concluding and making some recommendations that the United Nations government and they should ensure that women participate actively in peace because persons who have done so in in past they perform credibly well. Also, people with disabilities, they should be educated. And once they are edu edu educated, they will be able to move from the lower cadre or the, the inferior status which society has placed them. Then they will be able to contribute meaningfully in peace process. They should also ensure that women organizations, fairly organizations that have with this with this with disability they should they should be encouraged to form as associations whereby they can air their voices and once their voices are aired then they'll be able to participate fully in this process thank you very much i'm true yes thank you thank you uh so much dr omiegbe um, I want to ask, because I know that there will be some people in the audience and there's also some real connections between what we were talking about in the previous talk um, around the kind of role of women as active agents in these kinds of processes and situations. If anybody um, has a question um, based on the specifics of, of this particular context or um, something that you might be interested in from that perspective, just from the other panelists or people who've asked questions previously. Okay, we have a question for Dr. Thomas, um, but I want to make sure that we address um, Dr. Omiyegbe's talk before we move on. Does anybody have any questions before we move to the final? Ah, so Dr. Thomas asks, are there any advocates for women with disabilities in Nigeria are these NGOs or are they advocating for themselves? Yes, there are advocates for women with disabilities in, in Nigeria. But on, unfortunately, few persons with women with disabilities, they participate because most of them, they are not educated. 
in, in, in Nigeria, if, uh, persons with disabilities, usually they, they, they don't educate most of them. Most parents tend to uh, hide them from public glare because of the stigmatization that they face in, in the society. And parents of, this, of people with disabilities, people usually label them, they laugh at them. Because of that, they usually hide them from public glare. If you go to most homes, you find them at, at, at home. They are not educated. So this now makes very few of, of them who are opportune to go to school to form an, an association. But they are, they, are, they are very few. And most cases, their voices are not heard. And I think actually um, related to that, one of the other things that we have a question from the audience um, from Rebecca who asks that um, she would be interested to hear more about what needs to be done um, or what needs to happen in Nigeria to challenge the exclusion of people with disabilities in conflict resolution and peace building efforts. So um, she asked, in your opinion, is it primarily social or legal barriers or is there something else going on? Yes, a government has passed laws, disability laws, to uplift the welfare of women, especially persons living with disabilities. But on, on, unfortunately, the enforcement is not there. And I want to, to, to add this, that Africans, especially Nigerians, they are influenced by culture, by religion, and persons with disabilities, I can, I, I can say, they, some of them are like a endangered species. They, they kill them, like people with a hunchback, yeah, those with a al, al, albinism, then those that are, are intellectually retarded. They, they, they rape them, the, the women. Some of them do it for diabolical purposes, believing that they will have some powers if they kill them. So because of that, most of these radical people, the same people with disabilities, like I've said, they hide. They, 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 they tend to hide from public because mm -hmm. of societal attitudes towards them. Although, like I have said, the government has passed laws, but the laws are not being enforced. See so on on what we need. Mm. I think as well that for those who attended the uh, um, the session before this on uh, reproductive rights and women with disabilities, there's some clear ties there that you know could could we could expand into a conversation as well. Um, so really really interesting. So I don't know if Rebecca Camus is here, but I thought that that could be there could be some really great. Um, overlaps there in terms of what we're, we're thinking about reproductive rights and disabilities as well. Um, we, before we finish, we did have another question for Professor Thomas. Um, so uh, I want to move to that um, if we don't have any further questions just before we finish, if that would Thank be you okay. Much. Thank you so much. Um, you much. And really pleased that we managed to hear your paper eventually. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dr. Thomas, the question is, what do you think of the participation of women in the construction of narratives that manage to account for events of sexual abuse within revolutionary organizations due to the strong male charge in these groups, where, is a general, where there is a general silence about the recognition of these types of acts? Um, so, uh, from the cases that I've come across, specifically in uh, uh, Colombia, what's interesting is um, that there isn't anymore like a lot of silence around sexual violence, especially that which was perpetrated by um, uh, the FARC itself. So many women have come forward since the, the peace agreement was signed and saying that I was also a victim of sexual violence in um, this organization and they kept it secret for a long time, you know, um, and they still supported the organization. So, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how to answer this particular question because I don't think that Early, like during the conflict, women did a, I, I can't say that women did a ton during the conflict to challenge these narratives about, um, you know, sexual violence occurring or not occurring, but it seems like 
now that the conflict is nearing and drawing to a close, women are more upfront and honest about the things that they perpetrated or the things that they participated in and the things that had happened to them. Um, and maybe this is really important um, for truth and reconciliation and moving forward and recognizing that there are so many people that are likely to be traumatized. Those are female combatants, male combatants, and just people, civilians in society that are traumatized by sexual violence um, and all kinds of gender-based violence. Um, and just because you participated in this organization, even though women did have roles as commanders and they you know, were at all levels of, of the organization, it, it it did not mean that there was not also this type of gender-based violence happening at the same time. And so I, I, this is not specifically the, the focus of this project, but I do think that future research should help to understand how an organization like the FARC could claim to be so feminist, but at the same time be so uh, awful when it comes to, you know, the treatment of women in society and in the organization. And I think that like one thing I'm finding about all violent organizations is this du this duality, several dualities, right? Where they could be pro-peace and pro-violence, where they could be pro-women and anti-women at the same time. And these things are not easy to reconcile. Wonderful. Thank you. That's just such a comprehensive answer and it deals with so many of the tensions in those organizations and movements and contradictions and yeah, difficulties. Um, so I, we're about a minute over, so we've, we've done really well keeping to time here. So um, I'm gonna move to close the session. Um, so I would really just like to thank all of the presenters um, for joining us today and for sharing their work and really for everybody who joined us um, and for the really fantastic questions. Um, thank you for a great session. Um, we'll see you back here at 3 p.m. for our book talk on Jewish women and power.